Hi everyone. Welcome to the first unit of translation studies, history of translation theory. Today we are going to learn the history of translation theory in detail. Since this is a long chapter, I have divided it into two, part one and part two. Please remember that this is a single solid unit you need to study in the first module of your course. So, welcome to the part one of history of translation theory. Before starting, let's analyze how history of translation was categorized by earlier writers. George Steiner, a Franco-American literary critic and philosopher, divides the history of translation into four. The first stage is from around 60s BC, uh, from the time of Horace and Cicero, till the publication of Alexander Fraser Titler's essay on the principles of translation that was in 1791. The second period is from 1790s till publication of the French writer Valerie Labotte's and homage to Jerome, patron saint of translators in 1946. The third period begins with machine translation in the 1940s till the 60s. The fourth period is from the 1960s to the current period. He also gives certain reasons why he has divided them into four. Anyway, we are not going to uh, going so deep into that now because the periodization approach to the history of translation is a difficult method for anyone to trace the major figures and their temporal limits in history. However, we can rely on Susan Basnett's division of the history of translation theory in her book Translation Studies published in 1980. This is also one of our major prescribed texts in our syllabus. She talks about 12 time periods in history where translation and its theory made major impacts. The first one is the period of the Romans. It is said that Romans invented translation. The views of both Cicero and Horace on translation were to have great influence on successive generations of translators and both discuss translation whenever they discuss poetry. The significance of translation in Roman literature has often been used to accuse the Romans of being unable to create imaginative literature in their own right, at least until the first century BC. The Romans simply admired the Greek literature. They viewed themselves as the continuation of the Greek models and the difference in language didn't bother the Romans at all. Horace, in his Ars Poetica, spoke against the slavish translation where the SL text, that is source language text, is imitated closely by the translator. He supported a moderate loaning of words from the SL text to the TL text. In other words, both Horace and Cicero stood for the judicious interpretation of the SL text in not word for word, but in sense for sense translation. The translator's responsibility was to the TL readers. But one must not forget that the Roman readers were bilingual and they were not like the average TL leaders today who are monolingual and depend only on the TL text. So the skill of the translator was judged based on the creative and clever ways he translated the SL into TL. Or we can also say that the Roman translator enjoyed a certain freedom or license in translation since every reader knew what was said in the SL text in its original meaning. The next time period Susan Basner talks is of Bible translations. The history of Bible translation is accordingly a history of Western culture. Please remember that the Old Testament was already getting translated before the time of Jesus. Pope Damasus in AD 384 commissioned the earliest translation of New Testament to St. Jerome, the patron saint of translators. St. Jerome also preferred a sense-for-sense -sense translation. However, he was cautious not to make heretic interpretations in translation. For centuries, this debate will follow, the debate of whether word-for-word -word or sense-for-sense -sense is to be followed, especially in the case of religious books. 
John Wycliffe, an English Oxford theologian of the 14th century, believed that every man should be guided by the Bible and hence every man should get access to Bible. This led him to translate the Bible between 1380 and 1384, which marked the start of a great flowering of English Bible translations linked to changing attitudes to the uh, role of the written text in the church that formed a part of the developing Reformation. In the second version of Wycliffe's Bible, finished by his disciple John Purvey, the procedure of the first Bible translation is explained. According to that, the translators first established authentic Latin source text. They compared the versions of Latin Bibles, consulted the grammarians and religious scholars for difficult words, and lastly, took a sentence to translate each time. So it was like a, you take a whole sentence, you translate it before moving on to next. And this was again corrected by other scholars. In 1384, Wycliffe dies. But his ideas and teachings created a lot of political unrest in the country and its control by the Catholic Church. In 1415, Wycliffe's Bible and all other books were banned and burned. It is simply amazing to find that even after the ban, around 150 copies of Wycliffe's Bible were produced and people did it risking excommunication. You can see Bible translation making a comeback in the 16th century when William Tyndale published the New Testament in 1525. By this time, printing press was already established in England. Tyndale translated the New Testament from the Greek and parts of the Old Testament from the Hebrew. However, he was not in good terms with the English king and he was burned at the stake in 1536. The 16th century saw the translation of the Bible into a large number of European languages in both Protestant and Roman Catholic versions. Tyndale's Bible was followed by other English translations such as Coverdale's Bible that was in 1535, the Great Bible that was in 1539 and the Geneva Bible in 1560. One must understand that the Bible translations were done not only for the English layman to study Bible, it was also for downgrading the influence of Latin, the official language of the church in English culture. It had a political uh, intention of toppling the church as the supreme head of the state and placing king as the supreme head. Now, Susan Basnett goes back to the ancient and middle ages to say one more time how translation helped the education of common men in ancient Rome and medieval England. This is a third period in her division. Roman theoreticians like Quintilian preferred translation rather than paraphrasing to excel in oratory. Quintilian's advocacy of translation as a stylistic exercise involved the translation of Greek originals into Latin and Latin remained the language of the educational system throughout Europe for centuries. Towards the 10th century, glosses or translations done between the lines of the SL text helped a lot in learning languages. In the 9th century, King Alfred, who had translated a number of Latin texts, declared that the purpose of translating was to help the English people to recover from the devastation of the Danish invasions that had destroyed the old monastic centers of learning and had demoralized and divided the kingdom. In his preface to his translation of the Cura Postoralis, that means a handbook for parish priests, King Alfred urges a revival of learning through greater accessibility of texts as a direct result of translations into the vernacular. So we can see how translation in England was different in its intentions when compared to the Romans. The Romans did translations to study rhetoric to excel in usage of language. But the English translated for the moral and didactic purpose and of course for political purpose as well. Translations in the medieval times was of two kinds, the vertical and the horizontal translations. In vertical translation, an SL of superior rank such as Latin will be translated to a TL which is a vernacular of any nation state. In a horizontal translation, as you might have already guessed, 
two vernaculars of equal status will be translated. So the vertical and horizontal angles show the status of the language. The vertical translation is further classified into two, the interlinear glosses and word for word. Glosses, as I mentioned earlier, involves translations done between the lines of the SL text. And word for word, as the name indicates, stands for the word for word translation of the SL. The horizontal approach has again two types, the imitation method and the borrowing method. In imitation, SL text is imitated in the TL text. In borrowing, SL vocabulary is borrowed often into the TL text. Here, the issues of plagiarism are rarely mentioned. We can say that uh, Chaucer is someone who did a lot of horizontal translations. His magnum opus Canterbury Tales is inspired from or imitated from the Italian work Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. Now, Susan Basnett gives us an account of early translation theories. One of the first writers to formulate a theory of translation was the French humanist Etienne Dulé, who was tried and executed for heresy after mistranslating one of Plato's dialogues in such a way as to imply disbelief in immortality. Dulé's principles stress the importance of understanding the SL text as a primary requisite. The translator is far more than a competent linguist and translation involves both a scholarly and sensitive appraisal of the SL text and an awareness of the place the translation is intended to occupy in the TL system. George Chapman of the late 16th and early 17th century also follows the same principle like Dole. I hope you remember Chapman from my introduction to this course. Chapman's principles can be summed up like this. According to him, a translator must first avoid word for word renderings, second attempt to reach the spirit of the original and third avoid over loose translations by basing the translation on a sound scholarly investigation of other versions and glosses. So these two are the early translation theories in Basnet's research. Now let's see what happened to translation theory during the period of Renaissance. Renaissance or Renaissance was a period immediately following the Middle Ages and during this time a lot of interest in classical scholarship and values was expressed in literary works. The Renaissance also witnessed the discovery and exploration of new continents. Uh, the decline of the feudal system, the growth of commerce and the invention or application of such potentially powerful innovations as paper, uh, printing, the mariner's compass and gunpowder. Or you can simply call this the golden era of Europe. The translators became a bit more sophisticated during the Renaissance. A certain freedom in translation taken by the translator was called as adaptations in this era. For example, if it is a poem that is to be translated, the poem is perceived as an artifact of a particular cultural system and the only faithful translation can be to give it a similar function in the target cultural system. For example, Sir Thomas Wyatt, a 16th century lyric poet, takes Petrarch's famous sonnet on the events of 1348 with the death of his sponsor, Cardinal Giovanni Colonna and of Laura, a lady the poet likes a lot. This begins like this. Rotte el alta colonna el verde lauro, che facie nombra al mio stanco pensero. So this means the friend on whom Petrarch would lean as he would on a pillar when in need of a support and the tree which offered shade whenever he was tired. Here the tree is Laura, the girl he loves. He is singing about the loss of these two people. Now for Thomas Wyatt, both the Cardinal and Laura are strangers. His friend was uh, maybe Thomas Cromwell, a man of influence in Henry VIII's court in England. Wyatt translates this Italian sonnet into English after the death of Cromwell, but he omits words like column and laurel tree. Wyatt translates this like this. 
The pillar perished is where to I lent the strongest stay of mine unquiet mind. Meaning, the pillar against which I leaned for support has perished. It was the strongest influence on my troubled mind and kept it in check. It remains clear that the translator has opted for a voice that will have immediate impact on contemporary readers as being of their own time. See how the translator took some liberty with the SL text during Renaissance period. We can say that many texts were updated through translation by means of additions, omissions or conscious alterations during this time. Basnet reminds us that translation during Renaissance was by no means a secondary activity, but a primary one, exerting a shaping force on the intellectual life of the age, and at times the figure of the translator appears almost as a revolutionary activist rather than a servant of an original author or text.